Hello, this time I want to talk about big data. Big data is often talked about these days as the new oil. It's the energy, it's the resource that's going to power the network economy, power the future, power our lives. The more energy you've had in the past, the more powerful you were, the more wealth you can make. And nowadays, people believe that the more data you have, the bigger your data set, the more power you will have. In many ways, I agree with this. I, I, I think that data, and particularly the scale of data, of having a lot of data, for the next few decades will become one of the most important resources. It is the most important new resource, but of course, I don't want to gloss over the fact that it only, big data only works if all the other infrastructure that we've built over many centuries also continues. So we still need energy, and we need good climate, and we need cities and, and flowing clean water, and we need good food. All these resources are just as valuable as big data, and they're it, then they make big data valuable. So without them, if, if they collapse or if we ignore them, then big data doesn't really work. Big data is sort of the newest oil, the newest resource that we have, but we still need energy and these others to make big data operate. So what is it about big data that makes it so valuable? Well, what it is, it's data about certain things. It's not just that it's numbers, but it's numbers about human behavior. It's numbers about how we live. It's information about what we do, how we behave, how our civilization works. Basically, as we go through our lives doing things, that information is being collected and processed. That makes it very, very powerful because it's about us. It's data about us collectively as humans. And it's about data about me personally. And we can use that data about us collectively and us individually to make new products and services that did not exist before. And in fact, we can, in the best case, we can use that information to also create policy and civilizations that are better than before. Better in a sense that we can individually customize the environment to each person on a huge scale. We can improve the lives of billions of people in a way that we could not before. And we're doing that because we're using this data as evidence to make decisions. We're making decisions based on evidence, and the evidence is how humans behave. And we, we can do something as simple as try something, see what happens, collect that dev evidence, that data, and then try to improve it and see if it works better, and test it against what has already done. And that process is ver the very heart of the scientific process. So we can use this data collectively, in aggregate, and individually to improve our lives. That's the hope. There are many downsides to it, which is that information used in the wrong hands and used in the, uh, can be abused to harm us, to try and cater to our base instincts, to just try to sell us more stuff that we don't need. So there are many ways we can also be using that big data in a way that's harmful, not in the best interest of everybody, but we can also use it in a good way. And I'm going to, f for the moment, focus on that good way. So the idea is, is that more and more we can use technology and sensors to collect data about ourselves as we go through our lives. And that is a big process. That requires a lot of new technology. We can't quite do that today. And we can't do it because we don't have sensors everywhere, although we're making them smaller and smaller. They, they run on less and less power. They can run longer and longer. They can be more places. And we're also increasing the bandwidth so they can be connected and send that data anywhere in the world. And then we have to collect it and process it. Now, the only way 
that we know how to make sense of all this data that we're collecting is with artificial intelligence. So until now, we've been able to collect the data. We could have collected it, but we couldn't do anything with it. It just piles up. We have lots and lots of data that we, about you and me, but it doesn't make any sense. We can't make any sense out of it. We can't really use it because there's so much. There's exabytes. There's just terabytes per person filling up. So it's very easy to collect data about people. It's very, very difficult to make sense out of it, to, to make it useful. And that hidden ability has, has um, been unleashed by artificial intelligence. So I like to say that without artificial intelligence, big data is just a big headache. It's just a liability. It's not an asset. But artificial intelligence, when it, as it becomes cheaper and cheaper and smarter and smarter, will allow us to make sense out of this big data. So, we, so you need to have artificial intelligence to make big data work. Art, big data is sort of the rocket fuel to make AI work. Both of them need each other. You don't really have AI today unless you have big data, and big data is useless unless you have AI. So the two of them are kind of like peanut butter and jelly. They're just matched to each other. With the advent of artificial intelligence, we can make sense out of the big data that we're collecting. And, what we, um, and then we need several other things as well. One is we need basically uh, a new mathematics, a new computer science to, under, to be able to understand the data in real time. So we've been able to understand some of this later on as we have more time and more resources and more compute power. But to be able to process this big data that we're collecting in real time so it can really be useful, that is another level of science that we have not even gotten into yet. And then there's the issue of connectivity. So we have the promise of 5G and other fiber optic bandwidth that we need to have this flow. And that hasn't been built out yet. So the short story is that while big data is sort of the big oil, the big new resource, we're just now building the infrastructure of the bandwidth and the compute processing power and the new science of understanding how to run it. But those will come. And as they come, this evidence, this data about our lives, will be useful in determining policy, whether it's governmental policy, whether it's um, uh, how we want something we want recommended. All these services that we can kind of imagine to be customized to us personally requires us sharing or us allowing that data to be collected. Now, there are several issues with this collection of data about ourselves. And the most obvious one that's been talked about and will continue to be talked about is this idea of privacy. So if you're collecting data about me, at a certain point you'll have so much data about me that you'll know what I'm doing all the time. You may even know what I'm thinking. And that is an issue that we're going to have. So the second thing about that is that there's a history of that. So while in the past, when we were growing up, we may have done some dumb things as a kid. People forget about them. We move on to a different city. But in this world of collecting big data, those actions, those behaviors don't go away. They're, they're somewhere. They're kept somewhere. And so we can't really escape our history. The second thing that big data allows us to do is when we have sufficient data about somebody or, or some things, we can actually use them to make predictions. So predictions used to be very, very expensive. It was very expensive to make a prediction about what somebody would do. You know, if, if I was walking down the street, um, it'd be, you'd have to collect a lot of information about me. You'd have to spend a lot of time following me, you'd have to spend a lot of computer power to make a prediction about which way I was going to turn left or right. But when we're collecting um, data about everybody in big data and we have cheap artificial intelligence, making a prediction about where someone might turn becomes cheap. And so we now have cheap predictions about the future because of big data. So we have a thorough, complete history of the past. We have 
complete sense of the presence and we have a complete sense of the future. And that's very, very new. We have never had that before. And we don't know how we're going to deal with that as a society. But that's where we're going. And so there are certain attempts to try to reconcile this idea of, well, how can I be private? How can I have my own thoughts? How can I do something if my history is known to everybody and everybody can predict where I'm going, what, what, what is in my future? And so there are a couple of technological solutions to try and deal with this. One of them is called differential privacy. And the idea is, is that some of the benefits that you want to get by collecting information about a lot of people can be gained without actually revealing the information about any one individual in particular. It sounds kind of crazy, but it's a little bit like cryptography, where you are secure even though you don't know who that person is. You can be very reliable that that person is trusted. This does a similar kind of thing where the actual behavior of one person is unknown to the collective, but the results of that collective behavior can be shared and made powerful because we have so many of them. So a lot of what we do with prediction is based on the fact that you have other people that you're following and can use their behaviors to inform where you're going to go. That can still be done with something like differential privacy. Another uh, technological thing is called federated learning, which does a similar kind of thing where you take lots of individual actions, the big data for many people, and you federate that without actually having to know the particular uh, behavior of a single person. These are just a couple of examples of a technological solution where we can retain a sense of privacy while getting the benefits of having big data. So it's not a, a binary decision like you have to be private and unknown or you participate and everything is known about you. In fact, you can have both. You can have a little bit of both. And that's what we're trying to evolve, is systems that allow us to have the benefit of having big data about a population, about customers, about citizens, and yet still retain some sense that that person's information about their behavior is not shared all the time with everything. Ultimately, what we want to have is we want to have a system where the big data is the benefits are shared. They're symmetrical. So we want a system where we can collect information about ourselves, but that information goes two ways. It doesn't just go to people who are watching us, who are looking at our behavior. It goes to everybody, so we can watch each other and we can watch who watches us. So I would call it the symmetrical knowledge. So rather than it being asymmetrical, all the watching going in one direction, where it's the government or companies that watch us, monitor us, collect information about our behavior, we want to go both ways. We want to see what the behavior is of the people who are collecting us, we want to see what their actions are, we want to have a transparent society where it goes both ways and where we can hold those who are collecting this information accountable. Make sure that they use it correctly, make sure it's correct, make sure that we get benefits. So we want the benefits to flow both directions. We can even imagine, I think, at some point where even financial tra uh, transactions that information will be collected. This, by the way, is what blockchain systems do, is they ha they're, they're a shared ledger. They're often a publicly shared ledger, which means that basically financial transactions can be monitored, can be watched by everybody who is in that system. And that is another kind of transparency in which is a little bit more equitable. So. Even financial, transparent, uh, financial transactions may become transparent and may become part of this big data where how much we pay for this and how much we pay for that becomes part of the information about human behavior that we collect. And so 
blockchain, while we often think of it as sort of used by pirates and outlaws, can actually be used by governments. And it can actually not just be about hiding things and being anonymous, can actually be used in a public way to have a public transparency. So I think there's no escape from big data because we want to have companies and services run on the evidence of how we behave. We want to have that feedback loop where our behavior and how we deal with things can actually be used to improve our future behavior. That requires us collecting the data, the evidence. And so we're going to collect more and more of it. What we have to engineer are ways in which we can maintain that sense of our own self as being sacred in some ways, protected, while at the same time enjoying the benefits that we have of being in a community and a society because we are more powerful when we are sharing. So we want to be able to share and remain some private. So we have to figure out ways to do that. I think those are possible with technology um, and it'll be a negotiation and a constant conversation as we figure out how to do that. But I think where we're headed is this world in which Artificial intelligence allows big data to be useful to us. And we start to track ourselves. We start to track each other. We start to track society as a whole in order to use it to improve. So I think as we look into the future, big data will become more and more valuable because of artificial intelligence. And as it becomes more valuable, we'll also become smarter about it, learning it how we can use it best. It's going to be a long, long process, many decades. We'll be talking about this for at least 50 years as we try to figure this out. But for sure, there'll be more big data.